it's uh, my privilege to introduce our guest speaker this morning. Um, many of you probably already know who Don is, or maybe you forgot because there was a pandemic and we never saw anybody for a while. Uh, one of the things that's really wonderful is that uh, this is almost like a, a turning point. I know uh, when uh, Don arrived here, he was like, he was almost like, he was emotional because this is the chance they finally get to go out and, and uh, you know, be with another congregation, with the chorus, and, and join with another uh, uh, group of God's people in another place. And I know he's really excited to share with us this morning. Uh, certainly, I don't know how long you've been a, well, you've been working at Great Lakes for a lot of years. Like, should I just go like 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 25? I was, I was thinking it was going to be more than 20 for sure. 25 years, uh, which is quite a while, and I think actually probably way more than half of that, probably more than three quarters of that, you've been the, the president or whatever you want to call it these days, CE something or other, CEO, Yeo, whatever. It's got some vowels in it. Um, but uh, certainly we were, we're excited to have Don uh, speak to us today. And just before he gets up here, um, well, you actually, you can just come up. And we're just going to say a prayer before he... Uh, brings us the word of God, and um, then we'll leave it with him. Lord God, as uh, we come before you now, we're just so grateful for your love for us. We recognize that there's power in your word, uh, that it is inspired through your spirit. And as your servant at this time uh, gives glory to you by uh, presenting a message from your word, Lord, we just pray that you'll bless him. Have our hearts, uh, Lord, we pray that our hearts will be open. We recognize that you are in us through your spirit, but that uh, there is times when we need to listen carefully to your word. And we pray that you'll help us at this time to be very open and to be willing to, to be changed, to be moved, to be uh, of greater service to you, and to give glory to your name. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Tom. Good morning. It is a good morning. And Kevin is right. I, I actually have been a little emotional this week because one of the greatest blessings that I've been afforded since I started working with the school was visiting congregations. And, and obviously in the last two years it hasn't happened. So I was reflecting this morning, and I think I'm correct, I thought it was two, but how many of you in chorus have sung in a church with chorus? Just one, just one. So, I, I mean, in our current chorus, thank you. I know some of you have sung in the chorus before, a little while before, but, only one of these students has been with the chorus to sing in a church congregation. And back in uh, March 2020, when everything kind of shut down, I had an opportunity to visit the Brooks Avenue Church of Christ in Raleigh, North Carolina. And that was the last church I had an opportunity to be a part of and share in their corporate worship. And when I returned, the chorus was supposed to leave. This was just before March break in 2020. We were supposed to go sing at North Bay and Thessalon and Meaford for our March break trip. And it was literally canceled the day before. The border was closed the next day, and we all know the rest of the story. Um, and if you're anything like my home congregation at Tin Turn, you know, this is, uh, uh, it's, it's a rich blessing that we've been afforded the opportunity for this to happen at a time when technology enabled us and is still enabling us, for those joining us online, to reach out to each other without having to be in the same room but we all know it's just not the same. And so praise God, thank you for having us here today. It does mean a tremendous amount to me because your faith is an encouragement to me. Uh, and I pray that by again being able to welcome others to come in and worship with you that our faith can be an encouragement to you. I'd just like to say a prayer before I start. God and Father, I pray a blessing on this congregation I know that if they are like every other church that I've had communication with, the pandemic may seem like it is ending, but the consequences of it, Father, will be something we will be working through for years. Father, I know it's presented opportunities and I know it's presented challenges here at Bramley, so I pray a blessing as this church continues to be contenders for the faith, to reach out into this community, to encourage one another I pray for wisdom, I pray for courage, I pray for perseverance, and I thank you for the faith that they show us. In Jesus' name, amen. I love exploratory walks, which is a really strange kind of description. Um, I'm very purposeful when I say I don't love walking, because walking through my neighborhood a few times 
I, I just didn't like it anymore because it never changes. And I cannot, no matter how hard I try, be like my dog, who when I walk him every single day in the morning is so super excited to walk around the very same block every single day. I'm just not excited about it. I like to explore new cities. I like to go out to the mountains. I love to walk through the forest. And you change the scenery just a little bit and I can walk and walk and walk. And if you don't believe me, ask my family because they don't appreciate that gift that God has given me to walk and walk and walk, especially when they're with me. But here's the interesting thing about getting out. I don't know if you've seen some of these articles even recently, but walking outside can be a transformative and liberating experience. It can stabilize erratic thoughts and moods. Walking can bring focus and peace. So what could be better than exploratory walks? Well, walking with someone else, of course. So I've had these days in urban settings and on the countryside where I've been with my son Micah and with my friend and coworker Tim Alexander, the only two people with whom I've ever exceeded 30,000 step days just exploring and walking together. I have loved the half-day walks I've had with my son Joshua, who's here today, that we took from Niagara-on-the-Lake all the way almost through Hamilton on the Bruce Trail. I have loved the shorter but sometimes more rugged walks among mountains and temperate rainforests and waving grasslands with my sons and Emily and my uh, wife, uh, sorry, and Emily, my daughter, and my wife, Corey. And you know what? All of these places were beautiful and exciting and wonderful and refreshing. But the companions are who made every one of those experiences special. You see, walking with someone, literally or figuratively, deepens those relationships and blesses the journey regardless of how difficult it sometimes can be. So the inspiration for the message I want to share from you, with you today is one that comes from my love of walking and my walking companions and from something that has been said and could be said of many of our brothers and sisters who have gone on to their reward ahead of us. I don't know about your church community, but in the Tintern church community, it seems to me we've lost a number of faithful people in the last couple of years. And as I watched the memorials and I read some of the condolences for two particular people, I don't know that you know them, but one of our former elders and a preacher for many, many years, Wayford Smith, and Ray Miller, who was down in Phoenix and preached for many, many, many years there and started in Detroit many years ago. But there is this expression in their memorials that stuck with me. And the expression was this, that these two men walked with God. In my experience, both of those men were an encouragement. They were an inspiration for me in faith. And when I consider all the opportunities I've had to interact with them, I, I understand this idea of walking with God. And as I reflected on their lives of servant leadership and faithfulness, it caused me to question this, though. Why would I say that? What does that really mean, to walk with God? Leonard Ravenhill, a 20th century English evangelist, said this, smart men have walked on the moon. Daring men have walked on the ocean floor. But wise men walk with God. The prophet Micah, typically we don't talk about Micah a lot. Usually we refer to him sometime around uh, Christmas when we talk about the prophecy of the city of Bethlehem where the Messiah would be born. But he had a whole lot more to say than that. And he never probably believed that it would have been possible for someone to walk on the moon or for someone to walk at the bottom of the sea, but he certainly believed that the wise walked with God. He's a contemporary of the prophets Hosea and Isaiah. And outside his oracles of judgment and restoration, he's mentioned only one other time outside of his own book, about 100 years later, in the book of Jeremiah, when that prophet was giving prophecies and they were not being listened to. See, in Micah's day, he brought God's warning to both Israel and Judah, the two kingdoms. Israel did not listen and ultimately fell to the Assyrians in Micah's lifetime. But in Jerusalem, in Judah, however, King Hezekiah did listen to Micah. He repented and all of Jerusalem was spared. And so 100 years later, sadly, King Jehoiakim, 
He's turned away from God, and he does not like what Jeremiah is saying. And in fact, he is angered and decides that Jeremiah must be killed. And yet, some of the elders at that time used the words of Micah, who came a hundred years before, to legitimize Jeremiah's prophecy. And Jeremiah's life was spared. Sadly, neither his warnings nor Micah's before him were heeded, and Jerusalem fell to Babylon. Now, Micah's prophecies focused on Samaria and Jerusalem, the two capital cities of Israel and Judah, because these were the centers of political power, and they were also the centers of religious power. And these were the people with whom Micah had a message of condemnation and judgment, but also an opportunity for restoration. Significantly, Micah, unlike Isaiah and Jeremiah, for example, looks at these power centers from the solitude and the distance outside of where all the decisions are being made. If you could have a grassroots prophet, it would be Micah, because he was reflecting on the decisions being made in the temple that were having ramifications for the common person all over the country. And in particular, what he was seeing was how the poor were being discriminated against spiritually. And this perspective informs his words significantly. See, he calls out false prophets who prophesy for money. He calls out leaders who would profit on the backs of the people. In particularly, he calls out the wealthy who are taking land from families who have little else in explicit violation of the Torah. And to priests and spiritual leaders who believe that lavish and expensive sacrifices are what are needed to gain God's favor, thereby reserving God's blessings only for those who can afford it and withholding it from those who cannot. In addition, the priests put a lot of emphasis on outward actions, but they neglected to understand that going through all of the right motions without the right heart made said actions empty. What it all boils down to is the rich and the powerful hurting their own people for their own benefit and believing that they'll be blessed by it. But Micah is clear. Judgment will come. See, Micah sees a world where those in power oppress the commoners, where greed and control are driving motivations for actions, where the privileged are marked by self-serving pride and injustice and callous disregard for anyone who might interfere with that privilege. And today we don't have to look far to see those behaviors played out in our society every single day. But judgment will come. The question is, how will we be found when it does? We have opportunity to walk with God or to return walking with God if we're not walking with him now and receive his blessing. Or we can remain in our ways and walk with the world and receive his judgment. And this is the hope of Micah's message in which he identifies what is good, what God requires of those who would walk with him. This is what he says, to do justice, to love mercy, some translations say loving kindness, and to walk humbly with God. So as we unpack this, let's start with a seemingly trivial point, but one that I think is a profound truth before we get into what it's like to walk with God. Here it is. It's amazing to me. God wants to walk with us. And God wants us to walk with him. Leviticus 26.12 says, I will also walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. See, the Jewish Faith is the first of all of the world's religions to think that God had qualities that enabled him to want to interact with those that he created, with qualities to which humans can relate, which makes sense because we are made in God's image. So when we read these passages in Genesis, with Adam and Eve, and it says, Yahweh God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and he called the man, and he said to the man, where are you? It just seems like a familiar Sunday school story, but there's something profound in this. Even though it is familiar, there's this revolutionary development of religious thinking. 
See, the gods of other faiths were vague and abstract. They were cold and aloof, self-serving and capricious, like humanity. But the God of the Hebrews was concrete and personal, and he interacted with his chosen people, and he speaks to them, and he walks with them. This is the type of God that Micah had in mind when he said that we ought to walk humbly with him. Our God is a God with whom we can have a personal relationship. However, we need to remember a couple things if we're going to walk humbly with God. The first one is we have to be walking in the same direction. You know, Amos 3.3 says, do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Well, God invites us to walk with him, but only if we're going his way. <laughs> See, to walk humbly with God means to remember our place and know that although we're walking with God, that's amazing, but he is the creator and we are the created. And so we can never forget that we walk in his direction because he knows where he's going. And although we think we do sometimes, we really don't. This is why he chooses the path and we follow because he knows the way, because he created the way. So in this acknowledgement, in this deferment, there also comes a promise. The writer of Proverbs in chapter 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. When a person goes into an unfamiliar place, or some place that might be inhospitable, one of the first things we typically do is we find a guide. And there are some qualities we want in that guide. It needs to be a local, someone who knows this place. It needs to be someone who has some knowledge and where it is safe and where it isn't safe. And it causes me to think if I go into a place that is unfamiliar and I'm following the guide, it would be foolish for me to disregard what the guide is telling me. Why then do we question God's direction? It's tempting to take the lead, isn't it? This is what happened to Israel's political and religious leaders of Micah's day. They decided that they knew the way better than God did. So sometimes when being led by someone, we're tempted to question the person's direction, particularly if the path that we're on is difficult. Pride says, you know what? I know an easier way. I just have to find it on my own. I don't need this guide. I have a fascination with national parks, and again, my poor family has to suffer through seeing national parks, all of them eventually, but do you know how many people are lost in the, United Park, or in the national parks of the United States in any given year? The last year they kept statistics, 2017, there were 3,453 search parties because people got lost, and of those, 182 of those people died due to exposure before they were found. And while these numbers might be sobering, what are the consequences of walking away from God as our guide? Judgment will come to those who choose their own way. But related to this is another one, maybe one we don't often think about. Not only do I need to move in God's direction, he sets the pace. I need to walk in pace with God. Just as we think sometimes we know the way better, we grow impatient and we just want to race ahead, or we don't like where, what we've seen, and we're a little intimidated by it, so we drag our heels. And I'm going to tell you right now, one of the greatest challenges of walking anywhere with someone else is when you can't agree on the pace. Some like to power through and just get to the destination as fast as possible. Others like to stop frequently and soak in the sights and take those perfect pictures. When there is not an agreed upon pace, a bonding and enjoyable experience can become one that's exceedingly frustrating. <laughs> Earlier I talked about the different people with whom I have walked on this journey. And I have had to understand and appreciate that for some, I walk for too long, and for others, I walk too slow, and for some, I walk too fast. But if these are people with whom I want a meaningful relationship and a mutually edifying experience, I had to get to know their pace. And I learned very slowly, my wife would say I'm still learning, how much more enjoyable the experience is when we walk in step with one another. To walk humbly with God is to align our will with God's will. 
And this means personal pride has no place in this experience. That's why it's humbly with him. Neither does injustice. You may say, well, that's quite believable. Where did you go from humble to injustice? I think when we read this prescription of doing justice, loving mercy, loving kindness, walking humbly with God, we see them as three separate things. I would contend they're not separate at all. In fact, to walk humbly with God is to do justice. To walk humbly with God is to love mercy. And I want to I want to unpack that um, a little bit. This idea of justice. You know, when we look at it on its surface, most of us probably think or imagine a simplified definition along these lines: people receiving and getting what they deserve. You reap what you sow. We imagine a court of law. Interestingly, if you read this passage in Micah, he's actually presenting a court case for the leaders of Samaria and Jerusalem. And he is showing that they are on trial by God himself. But in a court of law, every person is seen as equal and fate with regard to guilt or to innocence, punishment or exoneration are determined impartially and objectively. Yet, if we consider God's justice, consider God's justice with me for just a second, do we always get what we deserve? Hmm. There's a song by a a group called the Newsboys that I listened to like 30 years ago, but one, one verse really resonated with me, still sticks in my mind, and the verse is, when we don't get what we deserve, that's a real good thing. And when we get what we don't deserve, that's a real good thing. You see, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? Romans 3, 23. And the wages of sin is death, but, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, Romans 6, 23. And this is why Jesus says to us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. But he doesn't stop there. This is the first and the greatest commandment, and the second one is like it. Love your neighbors as yourself. All the law of the prophets hang on these two commandments, Matthew 22, 36 through 40. You see, the religious leaders of Micah's day and the Pharisees of Jesus' day both went through all the right motions, but they neglected to remember that God's justice is motivated and informed by his love. Whether making the right sacrifices or quoting scriptures on a street corner, it is all for nothing if it is disconnected from our love of God and other people. Going to church, tithing, praying, reading our Bibles, learning scriptures, these are all good and right things to do, but in and of themselves, they cannot save us. Micah contrasts all of these external motions against these internal attitudes, being just, showing loving kindness and being humble. Jesus contrasts these same things when he says, Woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe and mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These things you have done and neglected the others. Humanity forgets, I think, the connection, and we focus either just on justice or just on loving, but the struggle is to understand how they work together. We see justice as punitive, and while it sometimes is presented this way, I want you to consider justice in the Bible. Almost always it is presented in a restorative way, to turn people from their sinful ways and turn them back to God. Justice is to do things right. It's to think and to act nobly. It's to live up to the highest standards, and that includes fairness. But God's justice is also informed by his empathy and compassion. In Matthew 7, 12, it says, Whatever you desire for men to do for you, you shall also do for them. Think about that. We want justice, but what if we're the ones being judged? I think if we're the ones being judged, do we ever ask for mercy? Do we hope for compassion and understanding? You know, consider the law of Moses itself. 
He knew all about the realities of human greed, and so it was required of wealthy landowners not to harvest their crops up to the very edge of their fields or to glean every single kernel out of that field. Why? So that later peasants could come behind the gleaners and collect the spoils and so have enough to feed their families. Exodus 19, 9, 10. These people didn't work these fields. These people didn't plant these fields. They didn't toil. This isn't fair. Why do they get this? Because God is a loving and compassionate God and he recognizes that in our fallen world, people will be vulnerable. Sometimes, almost always, not because of something that they've personally done. So we see this connection between justice and loving kindness throughout scripture. Isaiah says in chapter one, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless and defend the orphan and plead for the widow. And in Isaiah 16, five, we find a throne will ever be established in loving kindness and a judge will sit on it in faithfulness in the tent of David. Moreover, he will seek justice and, be, and he will prompt righteousness. And James 1.27, this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of God the Father, that you visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You see, God sets the pace. He shows us the way and he sets the pace and his justice can never be separated from his love. Kevin alluded uh, to the fact that I've been a leader of a ministry now for 16 years. And as a leader, I've had my fair share of criticism, and I will say to you, some of it was certainly warranted. I struggled, though, to respect or to respond to those who, in their passionate need to be correct, to be right, attacked first. These people sought understanding of justice. And sometimes I've been guilty of doing the same. Ray Miller and Wayford Smith were two men who did not compromise their understanding of God's word, but they could espouse their belief even when it was concerned about or critical of a choice in a way that made you know it was coming from a place of love and concern. Those men's opinions were respected and considered carefully because of the way they delivered it. In Ray's obituary was this statement, he was a hallmark of service to the Lord and had a reputation for maintaining harmony in the congregation while preaching the truth. Not one or the other, both. Now I'm gonna say this right now. Not compromising the truth, but being able to deliver it in a way that is compassionate and loving is really hard. We have to work on it. It's not easy. But neither is the road that we are called to walk. Going in God's direction and going at his pace is sometimes a challenge. But I want to conclude today by giving you a few assurances about what it means to walk with God as we do this. First, God will never abandon us in the wilderness. Is it just me, or hasn't the last two years felt like wandering in the wilderness? And I am absolutely confident that everyone in this room at some point felt that God was gone or distant. And consider the Israelites wandering for 40 years. And although they turned away from God, time and time again, he never left them. He led them as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He had a presence in the tabernacle, tabernacle and later in the temple. Most significantly, when Jesus died and the gift of the Holy Spirit came, we were able to come into the presence of God. In Psalm 23, David says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Moreover, sometimes the way forward is going to be difficult. It's going to be demanding. It's going to be challenging. The path just doesn't look easy or welcoming. And the side trail might be an attractive option. That's what we do sometimes. I don't like the way I see that going. I'm going to take the easy route. And suddenly we find ourselves without the companion we were walking with. There's that moment of panic. I don't know if any of you have done any kind of training, but if you get separated from someone that you're in the wilderness with, you go back to the place that you last remember seeing that person and you wait. 
And here's what I like to envision. I've wandered off on this path. I've realized God's no longer with me because I've walked away from him. So I retrace my steps and guess who's waiting at the fork in the road? God's waiting there. He's like, why did you go that way? This is the way to go. I know it doesn't look inviting, but I'm not going to leave your side. Walk with me. King Hezekiah understood this. He listened to Micah. He repented, which literally means he turned from walking in a direction away from God, around, and walked back toward God. And Jerusalem was spared. It was besieged. It was threatened, but it was spared. You see, when you walk in faith with God, he walks with you. And that means he's walking with you when the light is low, when the winds blow, when the storms threaten, but he's also there when the sun is shining and the air is fresh and the way is clear. Jesus promised to his followers, Matthew 28, 20, I am with you always. When I consider my walking companions, <laughs> many of the miles that we walked were silent. But there was always this incredible and conscious sense of the other person's presence. In daily life, whether we worked together or we lived together, the pull of responsibilities and obligations and trials and challenges often rob us of consciously being aware of the comfort and the strength and the bonding that simply being in each other's presence brings. And this leads to this other idea. We have to find space to walk together without distraction. Our world has so many ways to distract us. This is one of the great benefits, actually, of going out and walking in the woods. Put your phone away. Put the computer away. Just go out and take all those obligations, whether it's distractions in media or whether it is obligations or challenges, and go somewhere where you can focus in the quiet solitude of walking in God's presence. Once a year, Corey and I try to get away without our children, without friends, just the two of us, it's our, it's our brief annual marital retreat, best thing we ever did. Not only does it recharge us as individuals, but it allows us the all too rare opportunity to actually share in each other's company in a deep and focused, conscious way. One year, Corey paused one evening while we were on one of these escapes together and she looked at me and she said she had almost forgotten she actually likes hanging out with me. <laughs> you know, and we, that could be funny or that could be worrying, but here was the point. Strip away all the obligations and all the things that we have to focus on all the time and we can just enjoy each other. And God wants us to do that with him. He invites us to do that with him. You see, we need to take time to let go of the worldly things that distract us from our relationship with God. Jesus frequently stepped away from even his disciples to commune with his Father in a focused and meaningful way. In all our important relationships, this is something we need to do. For the Hebrew, when we use the phrase, walk with God, they immediately think of three people, Enoch, Noah, and Abraham, all of whom were explicitly described in our Old Testament as walking with God. Interestingly, all of whom are also mentioned in Hebrews 11, in the Hall of Faith. But what connects these men was that they were constantly and consistently demonstrating their faith. This is not to say they were perfect. We know that they weren't. Only that they were visibly and vocally faithful. Even when they made missteps, they were able to repent and return to God. And God forgave them because he is both just and merciful. So at its core, walking with God is a faithfulness lived out in a visible way. That's what walking with God is. Walking with God is fellowship with and obedience to God that results in his favor. Walking with God is when the manner of a life that a person lives reveals his or her nearness to God. And this is true of Enoch, Noah, and Abraham. But we also have examples. I know you have examples in this congregation or people who have gone on before us. For me, that is always who Wayford Smith and Ray Miller will be. And maybe, just maybe, you or I will be blessed one day to be remembered as one who walked with God. So my last encouragement, and perhaps the most important, is keep walking. 
Enoch walked with God for centuries. Think about that. No matter how many times you trip and you stumble, keep walking with God. Because God will not turn you away, even if you temporarily lose sight of the road that you're supposed to travel on. The journey is not always easy. It can be downright terrifying and treacherous. And we will question whether or not it is the right way to go. The road is narrow. And this is where our faith truly manifests itself. A few years ago, Corey and I were visiting Pinnacles National Park in, in Central California. And uh, this was one of those times I did not heed my own advice to pace myself with my wife. And I thought maybe she could handle a little bit more distance than it turns out she actually could. We walked up in the morning, it was beautiful. We had a lot of elevation gain and we walked down into this valley and we had our lunch, but it was, it was hard. And so you could walk all the way around what's called the pinnacles, these up thrusting rocks. And we could walk all the way around them and go back and it would have been a nice, level, steady pace. But what my wife didn't realize was it was a lot longer to walk around than up and over. And so after a couple of hours, and I didn't realize this either, there was no cover, there were no trees, the sun was blistering. So after two hours of walking in the complete open, she, uh, she stopped responding positively every time I gave her assurance that it was just a little bit further. <laughs> and we came to a fork in the road and we had to make a choice. We could go left, follow this little creek up and go through a cave and come out the other side and save a couple of kilometers or we'd have to go around and up and over the cave. It was a tough choice. My wife does not like closed spaces, does not like caves. But she was ready for this walk to be done. So we followed the creek up around the corner and we saw the cave. And as we entered her with a lot of hesitation, I actually had a sinking feeling in my stomach at first because I couldn't see the way through. It was completely pitch dark. There was a solid wall of rock in front of me. And as I looked to the back, I saw this little tiny source of light. So I left her standing near the mouth of the cave, walked toward it, looked up, and there was this lighter shade of gray in the darkness going up. And I said, oh, I think I found the way through. She said, are you sure? And I will confess to you today, I lied and said, yes, <laughs> I'm sure. Well, I stepped up into the hole, and to her eyes, I just disappeared into the darkness. I was just swallowed. So I'm guiding her by my voice, come this way, come this way. My eyes have adjusted, I can see you, and I can see her shadow down below me. The problem was is we had to step up. And the only way to step up into that little tiny passage was to reach up and grab a handhold on the rock side. The only thing that my wife fears more than dark caves are bugs, especially spiders. And it's amazing what the human imagination can do when you can't see what's in front of you. So she's at the bottom quite despondent and I'm calling down to her saying, just reach up. So finally I said, you don't have to touch the rock. I'm holding out my hand in the darkness. Reach up and I will take your hand. And she hesitated, but she reached up, felt my hand, I grabbed hers, was able to pull her up into the passage, around a tight corner and back out into the sunlight. Now she didn't speak to me for a couple of days. <laughs> I should say ours. And we can look back on this experience and we can laugh about it. But I think we all know that sadly, some of the dark places we find ourselves in and that we get through, we will never look back on and laugh about. And that is okay. What's important is, did we keep going? Did we reach into the darkness and take God's hand that he is extending to us to lead us through that passage? Did we move in his direction? Did we keep his pace? Did we focus on growing in that relationship with him in a focused and conscious way? May our hope come from his presence and his provision and by knowing that our brothers and sisters in Christ who have gone on before us are still walking with God. Only now for them, there is no injustice. There are no obstacles. There is no pain. There is no darkness, only God and his eternal love. May we heed Micah's advice and walk humbly with our God. Let us grow closer to him 
and thereby more like him. May we be just as God is just, restoring others with loving kindness and mercy. Today we walk with God through the field together. But tomorrow we go with those who have gone before us to walk with God after this earth has passed away and with it all the common trifles to go with him unendingly.